And one of the reasons that our technology is impeded and prevented from feeding the world properly is the failure of one of our networks. It's an information network and it's called money. About which we have the most unbelievable superstitions and psychological blocks which have been gone into at some length by Freud who equates our valuation of money with our attitude to excrement and uh, a very complicated lot of complexes grow up around that. But money and our psychological attitude to money uh, is a major obstacle to a proper development of technology enabling it to do what it is supposed to do that is to save labor and to produce goods services and so on adequately so I must introduce this with a story which is entirely legendary indeed quite apocryphal the great banks of the world at one time got absolutely sick of the expense and security measures involved in shipping consignments of gold from one bank to another. And so they decided that all the chief banks of the world would open uh, offices on a certain island in the South Pacific, which was balmy and comfortable. And there they would store all the gold in the world. And they put it in great subterranean vaults reached by deep elevator shafts. And uh, then all they had to do when one bank or one country owed gold to another was to trundle it across the street. And this was very efficient. And it went on beautifully for five or six years. And then the presidents of the World Banks got together and said, let's have a convention out on this island and take our wives and families. So about seven years from the date of opening, all those presidents and their wives and families went out to this Pacific Island and they inspected the books and everything was beautifully in order. Then the children said, Oh, Daddy, can't we see the gold? They said, Of course you may see the gold. And they said to the managers, Let's take our children down to the vaults and show them the gold. And the managers said, Well, um, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit inconvenient at this time and uh, perhaps the children would um, um, not really be very interested. After all, it's just only old plain gold. And the, man, and the president said, oh, no, no, come now, uh, they'd be thrilled, Let, let's, let's go down and see. And there was further humming and hawing and delays, and finally it came out that uh, a few years before, there had been a catastrophic subterranean earthquake, and all the vaults had been swallowed up and all the gold had disappeared. But so far as the bookkeeping was concerned, everything was in perfect order. <laughs> Uh, what this means then is <laughs> that money is nothing but bookkeeping. It is figures. It is a way of measuring uh, what you owe the community and what the community owes you. It is, of course, as you all know, a substitute for barter. If you worked on a farm, and the farmer paid you in terms of ears of corn, onions, cabbages, and uh, other vegetables. And yet you wanted a pot and pan of some kind, and you took a few vegetables over to the man who so made pots and pans, and you swapped. Uh, some people used uh, cowrie shells to stand for money so that you wouldn't have to barter and carry around all these inconvenient loads of, uh, of goods. And then, uh, of course, gold was used, because gold was rare, and because gold was supposed to have a constant value. Uh, you might ponder the question, when a banker buys gold, with what does he pay for it? The answer is a mystery called credit. Credit is bookkeeping. and. Uh, 
As the economy of the Western world developed, it was found that there was not enough gold around, if it were to remain constant in value, to exchange goods and services. You could, of course, have changed the picture by putting down the price of goods and services to uh, keep pace with the amount of gold in circulation. But nobody will ever put down the price. There's something in our psychology whereby prices always tend to go up. But at the same time, therefore, because uh, the amount of gold in the world did not provide an adequate channel for the circulation of goods and services, uh, all great industrial nations went heavily into debt. They created a thing called the national debt, which year by year gets bigger and bigger and bigger to the horror and consternation of old-fashioned Republicans who pay their bills. But the reason for the increase of the national debt is extremely obvious. It is that in an ex with an expanding gross national product, there needs to be more and more money, uh, that is to say tokens of exchange, in order to circulate the amount of goods produced, which is ever increasing. Now, I'm not an economist and I can refer you to the work of those who really are. But any fool can see certain extremely fundamental principles about this whole situation. And I'm speaking of the thought today of a man called Robert Theobald, who sort of ties in with the general picture of people like McLuhan and Buckminster Fuller. In having very far out thoughts and very adventurous thoughts about what we should do about money. But he is in the following of a man like Frederick Soddy, who was a Nobel Prize chemist, who was one of the first people to think really freshly about economics. Or people like Silvio Gassell in Austria and Major Douglas in England. Uh, he's in that following. And the proposition that he puts forward is very simple that money is a circulation of information and in itself has no value. Gold, of course, has some value. It has some value for an industry and some value for dentistry and some value for jewelry. But as a means of exchanging the goods and services of the world, it is as primitive as uh, post horses for carrying the mail. We must recognize then that money is a pure abstraction. I was on a television show a little while ago with um, Ted Sorensen and Raymond Moley. And they were having a long, long discussion which sounded like something that goes on in a smoke-filled back room of uh, party bosses where they were talking about the prospects for the Republican Democratic parties in 1968. And then they got onto the question of automation and the problems of unemployment that it was making and the difficulties of transferring workers from this to that when they were only trained for this. Finally, I said, the trouble with you gentlemen is you still think money is real. And they looked at me and sort of said, oh, someone who doesn't think money is real because every now anybody knows money is money and it's very important. But uh, it just isn't real at all, because it has the same relationship to real wealth, that is to say, to actual goods and services, that words have to meaning, that words have to the physical world. And as words are not the physical world, money is not wealth. It only is an accounting of available energy, economic energy. Now. What happens then when you introduce technology into production? You produce enormous quantities of goods by technological methods. But at the same time, you put people out of work. You can say, oh, but it always creates more jobs. There will always be more jobs. Yes, but they will be, lots of them will be futile jobs. They will be jobs making every kind of frippery and unnecessary contraption 
and one will also at the same time have to beguile the public into feeling that they need and want these completely unnecessary things that aren't even beautiful. And therefore an enormous amount of nonsense employment and busy work, bureaucratic and otherwise, it has to be created in order to keep people working. Because we believe as good Protestants that the devil finds work for idle hands to do. But the basic principle of the whole thing has been completely overlooked. That the purpose of the machine is to make drudgery unnecessary. And if we don't allow it to achieve its purpose, we live in a constant state of self-frustration. So then if a given manufacturer automates his plant and dismisses his labor force, and they have to uh, operate on a very much diminished income, say some sort of dole, the manufacturer suddenly finds that the public does not have the wherewithal to buy his products. And therefore he has invested in this expensive autom automotive machinery to no purpose. And therefore, obviously, uh, the public has to be provided with the means of purchasing what the machines produce. But people say, that's not fair. Where's the money going to come from? Who's going to pay for it? The answer is the machine. The machine pays for it. Because the machine works for the manufacturer and for the community. This is not saying, you see, that uh, this is not the uh, statist uh, communist idea that uh, you expropriate the manufacturer and say you can't own and run this factory anymore, it is owned by the government. It is only saying that the government or the people have to be responsible for issuing to themselves sufficient credit to circulate the goods they are producing and have to balance the measuring standard of money with the gross national product. That means that taxation is obsolete, completely obsolete. It ought to go the other way. Theobald points out that every individual should be assured of a minimum income. Now you see that absolutely horrifies most people. Say all these wastrels, these people who uh, are out of a job because they're really lazy. See, uh, given them money, yeah. Because otherwise the machines can't work. They come to blockage. This was the situation of the Great Depression. When here we were still, in a material sense, a very rich country. With plenty of fields and farms and mines and factories, everything going. But suddenly, because of a psychological hang-up, because of a mysterious uh, mumbo-jumbo about uh, the, the economy, about the banking. We were all miserable and poor. Starving in the midst of plenty. Just because of a psychological hang-up. And that hang-up is that money is real. And that uh, people ought to suffer in order to get it. But the whole point of the machine is to relieve you of that suffering. Which is an ingenuity. You see, we are um, psychologically back in the 17th century and technically in the 20th. And here comes the problem. So, uh, what we have to find out how to do is to change the psychological attitude to money and to wealth, and furthermore to pleasure, and furthermore to the nature of work. And this is a formidable problem. It requires the best uh, brains in public relations, in propaganda, in all that kind of thing, in all the media, television, radio, newspapers, everything. To try to get across a message to the vast general public about what money is. You see, the difficulty is this. When the public suspects that the money that is being issued, the dollar bills being issued by the government, are only paper, and stand only for paper, they start putting up prices. So you get an inflationary situation where the more paper money there is, the higher and higher and higher the prices go. 
which is uh, a very stupid psychological maneuver. And people have to be persuaded. Uh, the least effective way of persuading people is passing laws, but they have to be persuaded somehow not to put up the prices, but to play fair with each other and keep some sort of standard correspondence between how much is produced and how much credit is issued.